So I, I'd like to open it up with a very uh, simple, broad question. Uh, what exactly is transnational crime? Uh, what are transnational criminal organizations? Are they simply organizations or networks with members in multiple countries? Uh, do they need to have some type of organizational capacity, or is it something different? Uh, is there a taxonomy or typology of transnational crime that we should be aware of? Um, Steve, let's begin with you. Um, and give us your thoughts here generally, both in Colombia and uh, across the region. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's a great honor to be here, so thanks a lot for inviting me, and uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, I guess I'd just sort of give you a basic typology uh, just to start us off, and, and certainly we'll be able to fill in some of the gaps as we go along. Uh, the, the, the basic way that we try and understand these things is in, is in tiers, and in thinking about those tiers, what each tier has as an end goal. Certainly we start out with... Uh, the most famous of the criminal groups, the, the drug trafficking organizations, the DTOs. They're the most famous probably because they accumulate the most capital and you know they can influence so much because of what they accumulate in terms of capital. We're talking about social influence, political influence, obviously economic influence, and also because they, they have the ability to create virtual armies, little mini armies that often challenge the state um, for for legitimacy, uh, for territory, and other and other aspects of of the societies and communities in which they operate, the second tier is a, a sort of derivative of this first tier, and they are really those armies that they have created. Many of these armies that they have created over time have become independent. Um, they become independent operational actors on their own. They're almost hybrids of sorts, but they have a different uh, end goal. Their end goal is much more about controlling local economy, the flow of local criminal economy most of all, but also the legitimate economy, the legal economy. And they do this by controlling territory. They're territorial type organizations, which goes back to their origins, their armies really in origin. And a lot of their experience, infrastructure, and other things came from perhaps their connections to the first tier, but they've developed independently over time. And then the third tier are street gangs. Um, the type of street gangs that you have even operational here in Boston, like the MS-13. They're transnational in the sense that they have members that are transnational, but they're really still sort of hand-to-mouth organizations. They don't have a lot of transnational criminal activity, per se, that we can talk about. And they have a slightly different ethos, which revolves around, is much around sort of their rivalry with other gangs, mostly other street gangs, and that is, that is part of the essence of their existence. Uh, violence and their rivalry with another gang is really an integral part of what those gangs are and who they are. Um, obviously, all, these, all these, these different tiers need to operate in conjunction with, uh, with the authorities. Uh, most notably, I would say, and briefly, would be the police and mostly local police. They need to have regular interaction with local police in order to be operational, in order to have their criminal, criminal revenue streams flowing. Um, but also they need to be uh, operational and, and have connections with politicians, mostly local politicians. So a lot of the criminal gangs that we see emerge, emerge from a local atmosphere, and their relationship with the local police and with local politicians are really what give them a certain amount of coverage to do what they do. So that would be a basic typology in this. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, it's a, a fascinating typology. I just want to make one sort of observation. In suggesting that there's these three tiers, you're not suggesting that there's a sort of formal organizational structure or that they're always communicating with another. This is just a helpful way of ranking or understanding them, correct? Absolutely. Uh, just a very helpful basic structure. There's interaction amongst them. There's a relationship amongst them. There are ways in which they feed off one another. They often fight one another. There are ways in which some organizations can even sort of move to another tier, if you will, and we've seen that occur as well. But there, it's really a basic structure to give us an understanding of, and a, of, of the way organized crime works in Latin America. I'm, I'm specifically talking about Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, uh, Daniel Zhao, any any thoughts on this? Uh, first of all, uh, 
Thank you very much, Thomas and Ricardo, for uh, pushing this agenda. Uh, I know that it was uh, up to Ricardo to do the introduction, but I, I would like to say a few words. When, when Danielle and I and other researchers, we started Al Capone, it was on the diagnosis that crime was a phenomenon in Latin America. That it was, if you had the important, social importance of the phenomenon as measured by the social cost of violence and, for instance, uh, op what people said in opinion polls, the ratio of that importance divided by the number of papers written on that, you would have one of, one of the, the highest ratios in, the, in social sciences uh, overall. Uh, and that, that was one thing that motivated us because we, we figured that we had some capacity in Latin America to tackle these issues in an organized way. And that's, we've been pushing this agenda. I think it's fast, it's great that the CID has been uh, supporting this agenda with the leadership of Thomas that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a view here on what I am, I, I probably understand more, which is the third type of organizations, which are more the, what, what, what you call uh, street gang organizations. Uh, and I wanna just add a little to the uh, typology, the taxonomy that, that, that Stephen has so fluently gave us, which is there is a, a component which is a prison system that is really important to understand uh, most of these uh, uh, criminal organizations. And this is, one of, this is a very understudied subject that I believe deserves a lot of uh, <coughs> attention. Of course, my, my, my take is from, from the Brazilian side that we have a, a long history of uh, prison gangs that from within the prison system propagated their, their, their power outside the prison system. Uh, and one interesting aspect, and I think it's something that we're gonna mention a lot in this, uh, in this next 45 minutes is how do prison gangs interact with the drug trade? How do they uh, increase their power by dominating the prison system? And how they coexist with the state? Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the tacit collusion between the state and, the, and, 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 and prison, prison gangs in order to keep order. And on the fascinating choices uh, that uh, as a, that police and enforcers have in how to engage with these organizations because there are choices. Some, some of them are hard to recognize. Should you confront them? Should you coexist? Uh, how does that affect the legitimacy of the state? Uh, and how, by affecting the legitimacy of the state because you're coexisting with a criminal organization, how does that create uh, a phenomenon that uh, I was introduced by, for, by, by Thomas, uh, judicial cynicism that people just don't believe in the judicial system anymore. How does that retrofits into more crime and more power to this uh, uh, criminal organizations? Uh, I just, this is just the only aspect that I would add to the great taxonomy that Stephen uh, has given us. Uh, Daniel, uh, your thoughts, uh, particularly with regard to uh, uh, transnational organizations in Colombia. Okay, I guess, first of all, I guess they emerge when governments give up on regulating a market. It's not that drug markets are unregulated. They are regulated, but they are regulated by criminal organizations. When a government gives up, when a government gives up on, on regulating a market, on, for instance, the drug market, someone is going to fill that vacuum and start regulating by the market by choosing prices, quantities, quality, ways of transportation, distribution, etc. And when we talk about the legal markets or criminal organizations in, in, in Latin America, we mostly are talking about drug markets, uh, which in Colombia the, 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 the estimates are that they can account for between 2.5 to 5 percent of Colombian GDP over the last 20 or so years. Uh, and that's, that's a huge market. It can be up to $7 billion per year. Uh, that is under the control of very small criminal organizations, but very powerful. Just, if I could just add one thing. Just, just very quickly, 
Um, one thing that is often forgotten in this, in this equation is also the role of elites um, in, in criminal organizations and in criminal operations. Uh, political elites, economic elites, there is a clear interaction between these elites and these criminal operations uh, without which many of these criminal operations would not be able to operate. There's a direct co uh, connection to them, but there's also an indirect connection to them, and that is that they almost systematically deprive many of the institutions, state institutions, of the resources they need in order to fight these particular criminal organizations, you know, and what we what we call frequently impunity. So they foster impunity directly by not paying taxes and other ways. So I think it's an important consideration in all this.